Welcome to the weekly Legal Behemoth Interaction Session. Here, distance is a thing of the past. We will be providing you with information and resources to keep you educated, entertained, and informed. Straight from the curriculum with legal writing tutorials, right into our hearts with the personal encounters that we've had with the law. Not forgetting the competitions, the fun competitions that we will be hosting. Stay engaged and stay tuned. And remember, Legal Behemoth is the account to be on. On today's episode, we will be discussing on how to successfully draft a legal opinion. Well, legal writing and why it's different from other kinds of writing, like um, Gamuhelo, like I have stated in the beginning, today we will be discussing on how to draft a legal opinion and legal writing in general. Now, firstly, I want us to shortly discuss the following. What is legal writing? How do we approach it and how do we, do we get better at it? Legal writing. You must have learned from your legal practice module or maybe even written assignment, a legal assignment. Now, legal writing is not like other writings. It's not like fiction or the Facebook post. It takes many forms. It can, it can sometimes be persuasive. It can be argumentative. It can be objective or subjective. This depends on your assignment. Now, in order for you to be effective when, when, when doing legal writing, firstly, you need to observe who the reader is. You need to know who the audience is and whether you need to put, you need to put through a lot of content. You need to be a writer. You need to focus when you're a writer so that you know which ideas to include so that you don't include everything. You know what to include and what to not include. I'll give you away the secret right in the beginning. This is a secret. Now, general info that you probably must know by now, that law is based on English and it is also based on the interpretation of a statute or an outcome of a case. To, firstly, you need to ensure that your computer is set into the right language. In most instances, it is simple. It is the simple way of saying things are the best. There is no law of good writing. That is something that we all need to know. It, it just, it, it just, it's just experience, the set of rules and background of principles that can establish one's framework within which all rules apply. The application of rules will be different. Will be different because writers will judge the application differently. To transfer your ideas effectively, your writing must be precise, must be efficient, persuasive, and memorable. Most of the writing you will do will be about communicating. Now, when communicating, you want when communicating, you want information to be passed to the other party. The best way of passing information, of, of transferring information, is when the reader understands what you're writing about. Therefore, legal writing is very different from what journalists write and also non-fiction books and even academic writing. It is clear. It is precise, it is focused, and has different purposes. A great way to learn is to read. Really, look at the examples that you'll be given in class or search it in the web. I mean, at this day and age, if you, can, if you do not have good legal writing, it is an excuse. Why am I writing this? What is the purpose? Are you informing? Are you arguing? Are you being persuasive? Who is my audience? That is the most important. Are you writing to a client? Because that's where you need to know, am I going to use jargon? Am I going to use legal jargon? Am I writing to a judge? Am, judge, you need to be highly professional. There you can use um, um, legal jargon because it is assumed that they've got extensive knowledge of the law. Step number two, the structure of the legal argument. Premise one and premise two and then conclusion. Premise one is the most important information. Always put the most important information in the beginning of the sentence. Then you can follow with premise two 
and then we will put in the conclusion. Now, there will be an. I'll give you an example here. Here's a classic example that I um, that um, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. This type of construction is also known as syllogism. It's also known as the structure of legal argument. I stole this one from Mr. Vermillion. Justice Scaler of the USA Supreme Court proposed a variant of this format. He refers to a major and minor premise. The major premise is usually a legal principle or rule of law. And in the minor premise, usually a factual claim. Then we have a conclusion. Now, this system helps one to identify where the dispute lies. What is in dispute? Is it in law or is it in fact? It is very important for one to be able to identify where the dispute lies in order for you to identify what is the issue at hand. So if you know where the dispute is, you will know what issue you are dealing with. Research. Now, I think step two and three sometimes happen to be together. They happen to be amalgamated. As you do your research, keep this in mind. Each premise may require a syllogism of its own. This means that each and every case, each and every legislation that you deal with will require its own paragraph where you will put the important stuff in the beginning and then end by concluding. Now, each of these subsidiary arguments, syllogisms, should stand on its own, like I said. This process should guide the structure of your document. Paragraphs. Now, as we know, we've got paragraphs consists of three parts. We've got the topic sentence, we've got the supporting sentence, and we've got the concluding sentence. Topic sentence makes the point. Argues. It's where you put your um, important information. Supporting sentence, as you can say, as you can hear, it says, I'm a supporter of what the topic sentence has said. It means it serves to support, it serves to justify, it serves to elaborate, it serves to explain what the topic, what you stated in the topic sentence. Concluding sentence, concluding, covers up everything, breaks everything into one, and says, therefore, this is what I am saying. So it asserts the argument, provides a transition to the next, it, it sometimes provides a transition to the next paragraph. Only one argument per paragraph. So if you are dealing with the main idea or you're dealing with a certain argument or you're dealing with a case law, maybe you can have a case law and if it um, refers to a particular legislation, you can have them in one, but they must deal with the same idea. If it's a different idea, move to a different paragraph. Capital letters. Capital letters are so important because you cannot refer to a person, you cannot refer to a judge with a small letter. That is seen as disrespectful. That is just utter disrespect. When you are referring to a person, think or think generically, use lowercase. Apostrophes, two uses, shows ownership and belonging. A man's nose means the nose of a man. Where you put an apostrophe means ownership, guys. Make sure you use it correctly. By testing what you've written, say it in the of the construction to ensure it is right. Belonging to it is its, not its or its, guys. Apostrophes are not used with plurals or initials. Members of parliament are MPs not MPs. You don't put apostrophes. Another use is to denote letters that have been left out so that the word is con contracted. Wouldn't is a construction of would not. Only do this when you're quoting someone reported speech. So you can only use wouldn't when it's someone's reported speech. But remember, this is informal language. So in legal writing, we do not promote that people use your wouldn't, your can't, your couldn't. We do not promote that. Active and passive voice. Remember this. If you're active, you do things. And if you're passive, things are done to you. So use mostly active. But passive can also be used when you deal with persuasive writing, which we'll get on. Most of the time, avoid using passive. This is because it often violates the basic principles of writing. 
the core of the sentences content should be stated in its grammatical core. Words, form, and content should match. In a sentence about action, the core is who did what and who what. Who slash or what. Active. The union filed a complaint. A complaint. Passive. The complaint was filed by the union. Not precise, efficient, or memorable. So something is done to the subject. Can you can you can you share how different they are? With the active one, it says the union filed a complaint. With the second one, the complaint was filed by the union. So can you see it's not precise? It's just yeah. So active voice produces shorter sentences. Readers remember the information that was said in active voice more than in passive voice because it's an action. So passive voice can also be used, for example, if you want to smooth transition between sentences or if you want to focus on a subject. So that is where we, and other, other examples are given. That is where we can use um, passive voice. Sentences. The readability of your writing will be determined by, amongst others, the length of your sentence. Common piece of advice is always keep your sentences short. Or write longer sentences that are crafted into shorter, carefully connected phrases and clauses. Write clear sentences, but also be clear about the relationship between the sentences. Good writing will vary between short and longer sentences. The average sentence length should be about 20 words. So guys, try by all means not to exceed 20 words. Variety of sentence length improves readability and generates speed and interest. Quotations. Because our legal system relies on precedent, legal writings quote frequently. But you need to quote skillfully. So it is very important for you to know what you're going to quote, to be able to tailor the lead in to the quotation. Do not use stereotype lead ins. Like, according to, as one notes, authority has explained, states, if quoting text, if quoting text that contains a quote, double quotation marks should be replaced by single quotation marks. I hope you get that one. Quotation marks at the end of a quotation should be placed after the last punctuation mark. So if you've got a, if you've got a full stop, it should be a full stop and then quotation marks will follow. So quotation marks will always be at the end of the sentence. Correlative conjunctions, both and, either or, neither nor, not only, but also. Refer to numeral, numerals versus words. From one to ten, you need to write those um, numerals as words. You need to write them as words. You need to write the numbers in words. But from 11, going forward, going up, you can then write the numbers as they are. So you can write 22, you can write 25, you can write 155 million. So you can do as you please there. Commas. Using commas or not using commas. When you join two independent clauses with coordinating conjunctions like and, but, or, not, yet, also, then you will put a comma. Let's read the sentence. About a dozen lawyers were in the room together, and the discussion was complete and candid. So do you see? After a transition word or a phrase, and or but, Introductory phrase, especially a long one, or a subordinate clause that precedes an independent clause. And so on and so on. So these rules need to be checked from time to time. These are grammatical rules that need to be checked. So the rules that I've just spoken on and... There are so much more to go through, like semicolons, colons, apostrophe sentences, grammar, word sentences, slang, legalists, etc. Also, use Grammarly. There's this other app called Grammarly. You can 
print not print per se but you can take your document and put it into Grimelli it will calculate your plagiarism rate your level of plagiarism percentage um, it will also tell you where you add in your writing so I, I, I will highly advise that you use Grimelli exercises now let's focus on heads of argument and legal opinions now the purpose of heads of argument obviously is argumentative but it must be clear and it must be concise and it must be convincing so here the authority should be acknowledged either in footnotes or must be included in the text footnotes is the type of reference in that we use in law in essence then a legal opinion a legal opinion is an objective investigation into a law it does not choose a side but analyzes the position on both sides and then renders an option which is likely to succeed traditionally legal opinions are drafted by advocates on brief facts and directed to attorneys the receiving attorney will then study the opinion and advise his or her client accordingly so we draft legal opinions to know if we need to take the for, we need to take further steps if we are let me make an example that let's say Kamkhelo wants to sue Dayelo. um one of the um advocates from cdh will be given will be um will be given a task to draft a legal opinion in their legal opinion we want to know will Kamkhelo succeed we want we want to know will Kamkhelo is Kamkhelo more likely to succeed when he sues Dayelo, if he takes the step of suing Dayelo. So we want to know, should we take the step? Should we begin with legal proceedings? Are we going to, are we more likely to succeed? Let's start with the problem and do some exercises afterwards. Chris handled research just now. Obviously, you have to read the facts quite a few times. The facts are something you have to be extremely confident about. I mean, guys, you cannot write on facts that you don't know. Now, the facts, the facts that you're given will be the ones that will lead you to the type of research you need to do. They will lead you to your writing. Now, today we're going to look at one of the specific things and draft a short paragraph about it, but we're not going to draft it because it's online learning. I would have wanted to see how you guys were going to work around it. So this is um, an essay on schools, most problems and things like that. And the, the facts, if you do want the facts, we will provide, the Legal Behemoth Committee will provide the facts. So I just want us to look at how they went into, uh, about what they must argue and all those things. So here, these are the applicant's instructions. This is what they must argue. Now, according to those facts, they must argue the constitutional right to freedom belief and opinion so in those facts basically you when we'll you'll read the facts with time um there will be time to read the facts it's just a child who was i think um kicked out of school because of their belief in religion so with the respondent the respondent will also whether you are the applicant or you're the respondent you will always when you're dealing with things like religion and why a child was kicked out of school you go and look at the Schools Act. You go and look at the Children's Act. You go and look at the section that said that as one has a constitutional right to freedom of religion, section 23 and section 24. So we will both look at that. So the SGP, both the respondent and the applicant will have to do that in order for them to have had, um, to have um, knowledge of where to from here. These are some instructions that you need, moot instructions. It is important because we've got mood court and things like that. It is important to follow. Sometimes they give a number of pages it is allowed to. So ref, it will almost always be heads you'll have to draft. So you always have to, when we're dealing with mood court, you'll always have to draft heads of argument. There is the education, section, 20, section 29 of the constitution that speaks about that everyone has the right to basic education. Um, section 15. Of the constitution which deals with religion and belief and opinion um section 36 which speaks about the limitation clause this one will be um the the respondent will be the one that will touch on the limitation clause or the limitation of rights as they would believe that one's um right to freedom section 15 right to freedom of religion can be limited in certain instances 
Now let's check the Schools Act. We also have the school. Uh, now I am taking you through the procedure that you need to take. I started with the Supreme Law, the Constitution, and now we are moving to legislation. Which type of legislation? The Schools Act, as I have mentioned, can be applicable in helping us. More of the Schools Act, more of the Eastern Cape Schools Act. Then we move to case law. We've gotten our schools act we've gotten the sections that are applicable in the school act now we want to know which cases have been decided with regards to religion and educational systems educational system now we look at the cases we look at the um, sections of the cases we also have the mec of further cases we look at the cases and you can see the cases that i have looked at it like the other this case is a constitutional court case so it will be um, very helpful Cheat sheet. There we go. Major premise, like I said, all men are mortal. Minor premise, Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Application. Section 7 of the South African Schools Act allows for religion observation and things like that. Then what is, from your set of facts, what is it that is being deprived of this learner? And then therefore, your conclusion you can so every single time you will start by giving us your legislation you'll start by giving us your case law you'll start by giving us the section of the constitution what does it say what does it state because that is the major premise this is what they say this is my facts and therefore i am concluding by saying this child has a right to go back to school or subject to the limitations clause this child needs to adhere to the code of conduct of the school again when we're dealing with the constitutional court, in the case of um, it was held, a properly drafted of code of conduct set realistic boundaries and provides a procedure to be followed in applying for and granting exemptions. The court furthermore held that this is this is the way this is the proper way to foster a spirit of reasonable accommodation in our schools. Then we go to the Gauteng High Court. The decision that was taken, and as you can see, I've started with the I've started with the constitutional court judgment because it is the most important judgment. After the after the constitution legislation, I then brought a constitutional court judgment that was um that was um substantiated or that was by that was um referred to by the Gauteng High Court. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this session. Um, good luck. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Please email fisarkareta at gmail.com. Or you can also pass your questions to the Legal Behemoth Instagram page. It's Legal Behemoth underscore UFS. I'd love to believe that is. And you can also email, you can also email your questions to me. Um, one at gmail.com. I hope you guys had a very productive day and that you were able to listen to this audio of mine. Thank you very much, and please do join us on other episodes where we'll be discussing further the law, we'll be discussing the law further, and competitions on how to moot and moot court on online moot court, moot court competitions. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye.